Hello Space Fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, NASA's rebooted Kepler Space Telescope, known as K2, finds its first group of new worlds around other stars, and astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope celebrate the 50th anniversary of Star Trek by releasing its final frontier, um, field. <laughs> If you watch SFN on a regular basis, or if you listen to our iTunes podcast, This Week in Space Telescopes on iTunes, then you've learned that when the reaction wheels on the Kepler Space Telescope failed in 2013, astronomers came up with an amazingly novel way to keep Kepler alive in finding exoplanets. Calling it K2, astronomers use pressure from the solar wind as a replacement for one of the reaction wheels that keep the spacecraft pointed. This technique meant that it could look at other areas of the sky besides Cygnus, which was the area the Kepler mission was originally looking at for four years. So long as that new area of the sky was along the ecliptic plane, that is. This is the band of sky that lies in the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Using this new configuration, K2 has resumed its search for exoplanets. And while the original Kepler mission found thousands of new worlds around other stars, K2 had yet to announce any new exoplanet discoveries. It takes a long time to find these things. Astronomers need a long time series of observations to find dips in brightness of any potential host stars. And while K2 can scan a much larger area of the sky than the original Kepler mission could, this also meant that it took a bit of time to come up with its first candidate. It's also interesting to note that K2 is operated more like the Hubble Space Telescope is now, where the science community proposes for and decides what targets to look at. Well, this week marked the end of the long wait, and K2 came in with a bang, finding 197 exoplanet candidates. These were objects whose transit light curve suggested that there might be a planet in orbit around those stars. Now, candidates are not considered exoplanets until they're confirmed by more observations, usually from the ground. And from these 197 candidates, astronomers from the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea, the Gemini telescopes also on Mauna Kea and in Chile, the Automated Planet Finder Telescope at the University of California, and the Large Binocular Telescope operated by the University of Arizona, confirmed 104 of those, of those candidates. One of the most interesting set of planets discovered in this study is a system of four potentially rocky planets that are between 20 and 50 percent larger than the Earth, and they're orbiting the M-class red dwarf star K272, which is 181 light years away in the direction of the constellation Aquarius. The orbital periods of these worlds range from five and a half to 24 days, and two of them may experience radiation levels from their star that are comparable to those on Earth. Now, these guys have really tight orbits around their star. They're closer than Mercury's orbit is around the Sun. Still, the possibility that life could arise on a planet around such a star can't be ruled out. Now, many exoplanet astronomers believe that red dwarf stars are the best place to look for planets that might harbor life. They are very stable stars. They last trillions of years. And while they're dimmer than the sun, this has the added bonus that the radiation environment is also calmer and perhaps more friendly for life. So for our search for life, astronomers believe we should be focusing heavily on red dwarf stars. Now, Kepler's original mission stared at one spot in the sky in the constellation Cygnus for four years, looking for tiny dips in brightness. And as I said, it was very successful. But that approach basically meant that relatively few of the brightest and closest red dwarf stars to us were included in Kepler's original survey. And the K2 mission, with its wider field of view, allows astronomers to increase the number of small red stars by a factor of 20 for further study. So not only am I amazed at the extremely ingenious way that astronomers and engineers have revived K2 and kept our search of exoplanets alive until the launch of TESS, which will be in about a year, I'm also extremely excited about the potential for new worlds that K2 observations will provide. I'm watching this mission very closely. Next, while I am trying really hard not to think about the fact that my beloved Star Trek has been around for 50 years. Yikes. I had to smile this week when astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope released this image of the final frontier. Um, field. <laughs> 
Frontier Fields is a three-year Hubble campaign that's just ending that used hundreds of Hubble orbits to look very closely at six areas of the sky and six galaxy clusters to provide a glimpse of the early universe. Astronomers wanted to get an idea of the kind of galaxies that made up the early universe, and since Hubble isn't powerful enough to see as far back as, say, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to, it boosted its power a little by using relatively nearby galaxy clusters as lenses to allow Hubble to see even further back than it had ever seen before. But that's not all it's doing. Being the clever people that they are, astronomers made most of these hundreds of Hubble orbits by also imaging a nearby patch of sky in the same field of view as the galaxy cluster. Now by staring at different patches of the sky at the same time that they were looking at the six galaxy clusters, astronomers were able to build up essentially six more additional Hubble deep fields. They wanted to know if the distribution of galaxies was more or less the same in all of these parts of the sky. And I don't have to tell you how cool the original deep fields were. So this image is the last of the six clusters to be completely imaged by the Frontier Field Survey. This cluster is called Abel S1063, and the image next to it is the parallel field. Located some four billion light years away, Abel S1063 has a confirmed 51 galaxies, with perhaps over 400 more, and it weighs in at 100 million million solar masses. The stretched out arcs are very distant, gravitationally lensed galaxies that are distorted by the gravity of the foreground cluster. One of these galaxies is an infant, from a time when the universe was only 1 billion years old. This galaxy could not be seen without the help of the foreground cluster amplifying the feeble signal from this tiny galaxy. Taken as a whole, and in honor of the latest Star Trek movie, Star Trek Beyond, astronomers are calling the Abel S1063 cluster a warp field, an image where space-time is bent and light is molded by the shape of the universe. Sadly, as much as I love Hubble, and you won't find a bigger Hubble hugger anywhere than me, it can't do anything about getting us closer to these galaxies or bring the universe closer to us, quite like the Enterprise can. <laughs> still, it's a pretty cool image from an amazing telescope that is still doing really great things. Well, that's it for this week, Space Fans. Thanks to all Patreon patrons for helping make SFN possible. Thank all of you for watching. And as always, keep looking up.